things that the church wanted to hear about and study about. I started with the easiest ones, or some of the easiest ones, so that we could look at that and begin kind of studying. So one of these things talks, uh, that was Brother Mark Younger asked for the authority, spiritual authority, that kind of thing, and, he, and that was one of the Bible studies that he had asked about, the so spiritual authority. So we're going to look at, see in our Bibles tonight and see, well, what does it say about that? What is that supposed to mean? What, what, who are our really deacons? Who are those guys? Who are pastors or elders? Or what does the church say about those kinds of people? And what are we supposed to do with it? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to hop around in a bunch of places. But one place you might jump to real quick would be 1 Timothy chapter 3 and hang out right there. And then I'm going to reference some stuff. So when we look at authority or spiritual authority, um, we see a bunch of different areas that they talk about. In the Old Testament, we have prophets, priests, and kings. Now, what is, what is the common denominator between prophets, priests, and kings? There's something that those prophets, priests, and kings have in common. Does anybody know what those are? You have to be anointed by who? By the Lord. He's the guy who ordained, he was the guy who ordained those guys in the Old Testament. So prophets, priests, and kings spoke on behalf of God. They had the ability to speak on behalf. So when the king said something, you know, everybody that came from God because he was put into that leadership position, they would follow him. That's why they called him my Lord and those kinds of things. They referenced him that kind of way. So prophets, priests, and kings had this anointing on them. Prophets were bringing a word from the Lord, and oftentimes they were subject to the kings, and the kings and the prophets kind of worked together in that regard. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, and just as a reference there, verse 22 through 6-4 is what a biblical marriage is supposed to be. And in there, he talks about the husband being the head of the household, uh, just as Christ is the head of the church, he says in verse 23. And, and when we look at that, um, it says Christ who is the head of the church and of which he died for it. And so, or he gave his life for it, depending on the version, version that you have. We see that Christ sacrificed himself, but he is the head of the spiritual authority of the church, over the church. And he sets that up in the home as well as a spiritual authority leader that the wife is to submit to that. Now, I'm not trying to be a sexist or anything like that. And people nowadays get like, well, you, you know what? I don't know about all that. I'm not going to submit or that kind of thing. He's talking about spiritual authority and the structure. Now, what he also talks about in Genesis about both being equally yoked, but having two separate jobs to do within the family structure as well. So those both apply. He's not going to contradict himself. He's just saying there's a different, there's a different thing there, and somebody has to lead, and that some structure has to be set so that everything thereafter follows behind it. And so he sets this up the same way he is set up with Christ in the church. We'll flip over to Timothy. And so we see he's given this authority to elders and pastors, as we see this in Timothy. So flip over there, and you see 1 Timothy chapter 3. And some of yours have a heading that say what? Does anybody have a different name? Some say overseers and deacons. Who's got that one? All right. Who's got something different than that? Leaders. Can instruction occurring, in, occurring leaders. And, and nobody has a different thing besides... Um, Overseers and deacons? What do you got back there? Bishops, okay. What else? Does anybody have something different? Some of you might have, you might see something like elders there. You might see pastors there. And you might see those words interchanged and used there. Overseers uh, being the pastors and or elders being called that and deacons. Now that word bishop is interesting because that bishop uh, uh, says that this guy's over those guys. And let me give you an example. The church at Ephesus or Galatia, uh, Galatia uh, Ephesus was a super fast growing church and doing really well, had 48 pastors. They all met in homes of eight to 12 people. So in my house where I had my eight to 12 people meeting, I would be the pastor over just those eight to 12 people. Brings a whole new meaning when you pray for each other or go to one another in confession of sin. It's because he's talking about an intimate group. He's not talking about you walking in front of the church of a large congregation that you don't have a relationship with and spilling your guts about what you've done in your past. They're talking about going to each other individually and confessing those things to each other so that you have accountability within that to be able to strengthen you. So this pastor was in regard to that and is often called an elder. And the overseer is sometimes called a bishop or the guy who would oversee it. So 
kind of what Tommy Middleton is. He's over 108 churches in our association, and this would be one of them. He would be the equivalent of a bishop, but we call him in this denomination a um, uh, uh, missions director or a DOM, director of missions. And so that would be the same uh, term as an overseer. But in those days, that guy would write the message then he would come give it to his 48 pastors in those churches, and then they would deliver it to those congregates. They would get to 8 to 12, 15 guys. He would, each one of us would be looking for somebody to mentor who would be the next person who we would say, go start one now in your home. This is this whole idea of growth groups and Sunday school and where all those things came from. Sunday school, though, started through the Methodist movement, and when it took off, they took this from this idea of what had happened in that first century church. And they said, man, we need to do this and reinstruct people in small groups. And they started that up again. And there was a big resurgence in, in Sunday school because of it. All right, so let's look at chapter three real quick because he says some things about uh, a trustworthy statement he's, he opens up with. Now, he says, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. Now he's, he's talking about overseer. He's going to flip over to deacons here halfway through this discourse. The context is going to change. This is going to go through verse 7. Then he's going to say deacons right there in verse 8. And he's going to say the same, almost the same thing. We're going to look at just a little bit of difference of what those things look like. It's a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. Who, in verse three, who's got a different version of verse three that says something that says, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle? Who's got a different, what do you got? Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. Not violent and not greedy to money. So this, is, this word pugnacious that's used here in the New American Standard or in some of your versions is this ability not to make emotional decisions or knee-jerk reactions. He says you've got you to hold, you got to like, you can't just shoot from the hip and be mad because somebody roughed you the wrong way. You've got to be able to say, i got to think this through before I, I act on it. And, and so that, that's, a, that's a tough, tough one. But um, humble, uh, where am I? Addicted to wine, pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. What did your version say? Not greedy for money. Not greedy for money. Uh, same thing, good, good version, love, or uh, having something that you would put over. Now, the, to that term, though, love and greedy for, he's talking about replacing the value of. That means you rank money above other things. Like your job is more important than your family. Like you, you can't have that heart. He said, you, 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 can't, you can't do that. If you're, if you're after the dollar and it over supersedes, supersedes your family, then those things are out of order. This order is going to come back over to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 6, 4, when he talks about how the order of the family is supposed to be, and he talks about it there. So he, he uses this. First, five, four. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. Put an asterisk next to verse 6. Uh, this is an interesting verse, and it didn't mean much to me until uh, I came to this church. And um, I'll, I'll confess to you some mistakes I made as a young well, I wasn't a young pastor. I've been in ministry for 33 years. I've been pastoring and teaching and doing evangelism, but, but not pastoring a church. And so one of the, one of the things that as a, as a young guy that I saw a mistake in is my zeal to uh, possibly ordain somebody and put them into a position and, and put them to work and not having a long time to vet that person out. And I learned real quick in early in my ministry, one, one with a deacon and one in, in ministry and in, in pastors and stuff like that, I learned lessons like, man, I really need to think that. Well, now I'm really like gun shy, right? As I'm not, not like, poor Mark Younger is suffering from it because he, he surrendered to ministry two years ago. And I'm like, well, I'm just going nice and slow, buddy. And I need you to read this other book. I need you to understand this. And, and so I try to go a little bit slower on that because 
This verse has a lot of wisdom in that, in that you have to be able to, to live life and you can't be you can't be really, this term that he uses here is not just young. uh, He's not using immature in just physical age. He's using immature in spiritual, in a spiritual stance, that the person can be older, but be immature spiritually. And that would not be a wise person to put into that, into that position. You can be young though, and be uh, strong spiritually and be okay with that. We have an example in it in this book that we're reading, and it's Timothy. And it's no irony that it's here because Timothy's about 17 years old when he starts in the ministry. And so I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of weird to have this verse right here pointed at him, but the verse is not talking about um, physical maturity. He's talking about spiritual maturity of the individual and the wisdom in that regard. And so that's, that's very important that we understand that. Um, It's interesting what gets a spiritually immature person and not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. Who's got a different word besides condemnation? What you got over here? Not fall under the same judgment as the devil. Not fall under the same judgment? Anybody have anything different? Okay. So this idea that you can make a reaction or, do, uh, or react to something and, and incur judgment the same way the devil is going to. Verse 7, and he must have good reputation with those outside of the church so that he will not fall into repro- reproach and the snare of the devil. And so he uses a chiastic phrase here in 6 and 7. That's where he goes A, B, C, and then he goes back out to A and B. And he uses this right here. Who's got something different fallen to reproach in the snare of the devil? Who's got something different than that? Everybody got the same thing? Disgrace. Disgrace. Okay. Um, Good word. Those uh, understanding that he says, so this guy has got to be a dude that um, is likable on the outside of the church and on the inside of the church. If he's ticking people off, if he's emotionally uh, uh, off, if he's not uh, spiritually mature, that wouldn't be a person who would be the best candidate to be an overseer of the church or a pastor in a church. And then he goes to deacons, verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain. Who's got a different verse that says something different than that? Does anybody have anything different? What you got? Read it real loud. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so we see the same kind of standards that they're setting for the deacons that they set for the pastor, and there's just some slight differences in how they're doing, but he's saying, likewise, these guys have to have the same kind of character. It says, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, this is an interesting verse, verse 9. You want to put an asterisk next to it. But holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The phraseology here in Greek means this. If you struggle with something scripturally, you need to hold fast to the gospel truth of your faith and not be swayed by it or think that, they, that, that your whole belief system can be ruffled because you don't understand something. That means if you're reading through the scripture and you get to that verse, and there's some verses you might get to and you're like, Man, that, 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 that verse is hard to swallow. I don't know that I can can quite understand that. He's saying, you gotta, you gotta hold fast to the fact that it's God's word, he doesn't make a mistake, and He is giving you the truth, and you gotta hold to that truth and walk in that way. He says they're not swayed by anything that the script, they're gonna read in the scripture, they're gonna hold to that, even in the areas that they don't quite understand. Verse 10, these men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. So we have a policy here where we take guys about a year and a half and they get on one of our deacon's hips and they got to read a couple books and they go through those things and they start acting and they start following and they start doing some of the stuff that the deacons do within the church. And in this process, our deacons get with these guys and they meet with them and they come to the fellowship breakfast with the deacons and they help and they hang out with those guys. And really the job of the other deacons is to look at the guy and say, is this guy in and out of the community level-headed? Is this guy a guy who loses his temper? Is he a guy who, 
who is, is, treats his wife bad? Is he a guy who is balanced? Is, is he got his household in control? All these things are kind of, they're kind of balancing. Now, all of us sitting in here are going, shoot, I just failed half of that list. <laughs> you know, those are struggles. We know we don't all walk on water, but you can tell when somebody's trying and when somebody's not, right? And so we need to know that that guy is actually doing his best. He loves the Lord and he's doing his best to, to get his family to follow along with him and follow God's teaching. Verse 10, these men must also first be tested and serve as deacons if they're beyond reproach. Verse 11, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Put an asterisk next to 11. Here's where a lot of churches struggle, and here's where denominations split right here. They go, oh, well, the deaconess. Now, the word deaconess is used in the scripture. But I believe, as most conservative theologians believe, that this term right here when he says women is talking about the deacon's wife. And he says the deacon's wife has to be above reproach in the same manner that he's above reproach. That this woman is a reflection of the church. If this guy's going to be ordained, when he goes to the door and he knocks on the door, she's with them. And she's there. And she's, she's doing those things, and she is a reflection of who the church is. So part of that process is to look and say, well, are we doing all those things? Now, again, we don't live in a perfect world, and people have ups and downs, and people go through stuff. I've seen people in our church in, in San Diego and in Slidell where a deacon's been a deacon for years and years. His wife takes ill. She has an operation. Um, she's not the same woman when she comes out of the operating room. Her health is declining. It's changed her character to a degree, to a degree and, and, and stuff happens, and you, you're going to have to balance life. And I understand that, and you give grace on that. So now he's pushing his wife around in a wheelchair, and she's hitting people with her cane, and she's going by him, you know, and you're like, that's the deacon's wife, and you're like, what in the world, you know? Is it for real? And really, it's, so here's what, my, what I'm telling you. Watch this. It's a package. It's a package deal when you look at a deacon and you're looking at them and you're saying, wow, what's, what's the deal with that? For the pastor, he says, you've got to be balanced with your family. For this deacon, he pulls the wife straight in with him. And he says, she's a reflection of who you are. And so that's important. So as we look at our deacons, as we look at those guys who go through this process, as we look at this order, this, this idea of submission to spiritual authority. We're looking at these guys saying, man, these guys are guys we're supposed to look up to and do this. So he says this of women in verse 11, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate and faithful in all things. So he comes right out and he says, man, these, he gives some specific standards of what they shouldn't be doing and what they should be. Then he comes back and he says, deacons must be husbands of only one wife, and good managers of their children and their own households. Who has only one wife? Who has a different word besides only? Anybody have something different there? Of, of what? Of but. of but one wife? Okay. You'll notice that um, in the overseer, um, the husband of one wife, he has one wife. And then the deacon, it says, of only one wife. <laughs> All right? So, so here is the issue in the first century church. You were allowed to have more than one wife, and they didn't, and they didn't do it. A guy who did one of the best studies on this is Dr. Charles Stanley. Dr. Charles Stanley, about 35, 40 years ago, his wife was one of those ladies who got ill, uh, and it affected her brain. And uh, she was making some decisions that were a little, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying anything negative about her or anything like that, um, but she just kind of, came unglued after a little while, and she uh, snapped one day and said, I, I don't want to be married to you. Now, here's Charles Stanley. He has a, he has a, he has a pastorate in First Baptist Atlanta, and there's 20,000 people in the church at the time, 20,000, and he is the pastor. And his wife says, I'm divorcing you. And he's like, so Charles Stanley, being the good Southern Baptist as he is, he's like, I'm going to step down. And so he steps down because his interpretation of the scripture verse was the same interpretation that I had initially when I first went to seminary was you're to be the husband of one wife. You're done. If you're, if you're divorced, you can't be a pastor. And I, I just kind of took it as that. And he went to step down at First Baptist Atlanta. And his congregation said, 
we don't want you to step down. That wasn't your fault. You didn't sign up for that camp. We know what happened. We've been here the whole time. We don't want you to step down. We want you to continue to serve. And he struggled with that. So Dr. Stanley wrote almost a complete new doctoral dissertation on, this, on these verses right here because he wanted to understand what it was saying. And it was pretty cool because one of the things that got me to come to this was a letter from him to encourage me to come serve here through my uh, friend, Dr. Dukes, at New Orleans Seminary. When I said, I don't want to come pastor a church, I don't believe I'm qualified to because of my past. And this letter from Dr. Stanley changed my whole mind on it. And I said, well, if it's God's will, then I, I will do that because it's kind of the same kind of standards that happened and got me here that got him where he is. And so what happened was this. When you look at the context of overseer and the deacon, and he says specifically in the deacon area, only one wife, like he's emphasizing it, is because in a lot of those areas, these guys were already, uh, it, it wasn't a negative thing, but like, let's say I'm the dad, John's my son, and we have another son, Timothy. Timothy dies, and, let, and, let, and let's say it's Miss Scott, was his wife, John would take the responsibility of making sure she has some place to live and some place to stay and to take care of her and raise her and take her in as his wife because that was the law or Jewish law that they followed. And he took the responsibility of finding her. If she couldn't get a husband, he took her into his house and she was called his wife. So now he had two wives in his home. And so when he, Paul's writing, he's saying, his standard goes, you need to catch this. You only need to have one wife if you're going to be a deacon, and you only need to have one wife if you're going to be a pastor, because if you think you can, can have a problem managing a church right now, think about managing three wives and 18 children, let alone one wife and six children. And he says, it's too tough to do. You need to be able to balance it. Brother David. So here's the argument on that. I'm not arguing with you. I would lean towards you because in the overseer, a wife is mentioned as a, you only can have one wife if you have a wife. And in the deacon, it says only one wife, and then it says women right underneath it. And that's true, Brother David. And they think because in that first century church, when they when we were about to look at in chapter six of Acts, when they picked the first seven deacons of a church, they came into this place, and the Hebrew people were ministering to the Hebrew people, and the new Greek converts, they weren't ministering to them because the women wore their hair down, they had earrings on, and they had lipstick on their lips, and to the Hebrews, that was a sign of, you're a prostitute if you wear lipstick, and you are a prostitute if you wear earrings, and if you're wearing your hair down, you are selling yourself. And so if somebody came into the church and they sat down next to them, the Hebrew woman would get up and she would move down to the other side like, I, I'm not mixed with them. And it created a conflict there. So when they go to pick those seven deacons, you'll notice that they pick seven guys with Greek names. And they will go and they pick these guys within their community, watch this, who can relate to their community. John teaches baseball and soccer and he works at, I always say Air Lakeed, but it's SNF. SNF, which is a subsidiary, right, of, of those guys? Yeah, we're both French. Both French. <laughs> I've been saying it wrong for seven years now. SNF, it's a French company out of France. And, uh, but he's well-known in the community. He teaches soccer. He teaches those things. And so he, he, he's well-known in and among the community. And picking somebody who's a deacon within your community who's plugged in like that is key to the success of the church. And he says, you've got to get people who know your people. And I'm not Cajun. But uh, half of our deacons are, and those guys know how to mix and mingle with those guys on the bayou and everything else. And so the guys who got, guess what, who got invited to our church from the bayou weren't necessarily invited by me and not by John, who I think is traditionally from where? Where are you from, John? I grew up in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? I knew you were a Yankee guy up there, of some, somewhere over there. But then the <laughs> Orioles. <laughs> Orioles. And uh, so... You take guys from your community who know the community and they go out and those guys become the deacons in it. So when you choose those deacons, you're picking guys within your community and congregation to be able to go out and their wives to be able to do the ministry to the ladies within the church so that those guys are not isolated out of there. So go back to uh, um, this interesting deacon point. So Charles Stanley goes back and he serves. 
uh, he serves in, and continues to serve as a pastor, and he, he never married again, although um, uh, I know his girlfriend uh, that he has finally. So I'm 20 years later, he, you know, after 20 years waiting around, she's here in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I don't know that you know that he flies here in Baton Rouge as well. They, they go out on a date, and he goes back, and they, they live a very integrity-filled relationship. But this is you know, where he is, and he continues to serve at First Atlanta, uh, but he wrote this whole dissertation in understanding, and so I got a chase the rabbit. But the context there is to be in control of your family and be the husband of only one wife. So he says it's the guy who's able to balance his personal life and family life is the guy that you're looking for for the pastor or the deacon. That guy's got to be in control of that. And in the deacon's case, he ties the wife in as you have to be that way too. And he ties it in. So I'd have to agree with you on that, Brother David, because half of, of conservative theologians are split on that thing. They say, well, I don't know if they have to have a, a wife, but it goes and fits, and here's their argument, it fits in context because it says they cannot be immature in that way spiritually, so they have to be able to know how to minister to people. How would a deacon know how to minister to another family if he wasn't married? It'd be, it would be a tough thing. A single guy doesn't have a lot of wisdom to share with a family that's going through a tough time. And so there, are, there is a split on the issue that maybe you need to have a wife as a deacon, and it's one of the things that they looked for on purpose. We know and acts that those guys who were picked were all married as well. And so we, we have a pretty good, pretty good idea that that's what's going on. All right, where was I left off? Um... Verse 12, deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children, there you go with that management thing, and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that it is in Christ Jesus. All right, so we see the spiritual authority within the pastor slash overseer and or the deacons. So it's, it's interesting to know that as we look at this in Acts, if you look at it real quick in Acts, go to the left, chapter 6. And verse 3 says, Therefore, brethren, select among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. This idea of wisdom and full of the spirit, he's talking about uh, spiritual maturity and wisdom is used in the way of the world. And this is also part of the argument that says, yeah, they need to have a wife. Because yeah, I, I, can a single guy have a lot of wisdom on giving coaching or help or advice to a couple? Probably not. And so it makes sense that that would be one of those things that that would be why. Now, when I go to someone's house, Danielle does a lot of ministry sometimes to people when I, I'm not going to talk to the woman and she will talk to the woman and she will talk to somebody or she talks to a lot of the ladies in the church and will do that and give her wisdom or thoughts there. And same with the deacons. When they go to the house, they can be able to be the ministry or the, or the help to those ladies who need that help as well. And they do a lot of the, the stuff. The thing about the deacon, though, and the wife and the deaconess is that the deaconess is tasked to do some things within the church purposefully. So to do ministry purposefully. Somebody gets hurt, somebody's dying in the hospital. It's a lady. It's kind of a rough situation. Send a deaconess over there. The wife of one of our deacons, she goes in there and she prays this lady because it's kind of a, a rough situation and it's just not a good time for the husband to be in there. I've been in you know, to hospitals with people who are dying. They got to clean them up. I got to step out. It's a lady, but I can leave Danielle. She's holding her hand because the lady asked for her not to leave, and she'll be holding her hand while they're sponge bathing her and trying to clean her up because of an accident or something. I, I have to leave. I, I just can't, you know, I'm not going to be in there. And so we see some pretty neat, cool roles as God utilizes the family unit and makes them one to be able to do ministry together. Now, again, we don't live in a perfect world. Not everybody can do that. Life gets us sometimes and slows us down and can stop us from serving, but we need to be ready to do all of those things. Uh, quickly, 
pastors serve in authority uh, with other leaders within their congregation. In the early church, churches typically had multiple elders or pastors who worked together to lead the church. This helped to avoid problems with single leader assume too much power or authority. Team leadership can help remove the problem of pastor taking too much authority over church members. There's a reason, you know, some of the, uh, the terminology people talk about senior pastor. I'm the senior pastor. The term that they're using now is kind of like I, the same term that I use. I say I'm the lead pastor of the church, and I will reference Pastor Ben. I'll say Pastor Ben. I try to get our deacons to say, hey, make sure we say Pastor Ben or Pastor Tom to kind of get in the mindset of the people that those guys are pastors. They have certain duties within there. At one point where our church had four pastors within it, we're about to have three again. And we're about to uh, uh, continue to expand, and we're excited about that. But as they do their roles, uh, no one guy can do the whole thing. Most pastors and churches, if you look up and down Highway 1, just for an example, or even in, in Baton Rouge anywhere, if you see a church with one pastor, one leader in it, the church usually gets to about 90 to 120, and it stays right about there. If they're doing really good and he's got a tank full of gas, and he's got it in fifth gear, and he's hitting on all cylinders. And then as he slows down, as he gets older, the congregation drops down to about 60, 80. Hangs there for a little while. He gets a little older. It drops down to about 40 and stays there unless he goes and he gets and hires another pastor to, to help him, to help him out. Traditionally, even if the pastor's hitting on all cylinders, if you're really good, you could manage probably about 120 150 if you're really good. But after that, you can't touch those people anymore. Same thing happened here. When my first ministry here, today's the uh, um, anniversary of the death of a friend this week coming up, uh, Jeanette Koenig. Everybody remembers Jeanette. Um, she played our piano. We get choked up when I talk about her. <laughs> She was already stoved up with arthritis. You know, when she was playing, she couldn't hardly play well at all. And she would always say that afterwards, you know, so that you wouldn't make fun of her. Nobody was making fun of her, but she would always say that because she hated that she couldn't play the piano like she used to play the piano when she was younger. But I loved Miss Jeanette to death, and I, I watched her pass away. And this week uh, was the anniversary that I did her um, um, funeral here. And um, she died three, four months before my mom died. And so I did her funeral, and then, you know, it was two months later, I get word my mom's dying, and the deacons sent me uh, to see my mom pass. And I was like, man, that was, that was kind of a rough, rough year that year, 2014. And I was like, man, that was just, that was a rough thing. But the thing about Miss um, Koenig and, uh, is she was a lady who had a lot of wisdom, and at that part of the church, I would go to their house and sit down with her at the table in their little sunroom with Bill, her husband, and I'd have coffee. And I'd go there and I'd have coffee with them and I would go over to another one of our ladies' houses and have coffee with them. And at the beginning, to go from a small church to 120 people was really easy because you were able to have watch us a personal relationship with every single one of them. And it's easy to grow a church when you have a personal relationship with us. This, watch this. This is why it's so important to have small groups in Sunday school classes. Remember the thing I started at the beginning with the churches of having 8 to 12 people in each one of them? You know why people stick in those churches? Because every day they were having a conversation and there's no miscommunication. There's this relationship that's built with each other and you're seeing each other on a daily basis. That's how those churches grew like that. What happened was in 505, they built a church like this for the first time, and they made it beautiful. And they put these ornate marble floors and pillars and statues, and it was awesome. And people would come in there, and when you sing, your voice would echo throughout the whole place, and it was beautiful. But they lost the connection, and they would fill them up, 1,500 people in there. But the pastor didn't know who was sitting on the eighth row back. He didn't, he didn't know what was going on in your life. Because the pastoring went from the homes and small groups into this large congregation, and they became out of touch with those people. And so it was driven on being faithful to come to church, being told that you would be faithful if you came to church, and so you would will yourself to come there. And at about 500 A.D., we entered into the Dark Ages, between 500 A.D. to about 1500 A.D., where there was no more reading of the Bible you came in and listened to what I had to say. If you didn't come, you were sinning. And they were taught that, and the church began to wane 
on its strength and its faith. It was growing because people were scared if they didn't go, they were going to go to hell. And if you were raised Catholic, that's, you, you, would, you would know how, how that was working because that's what we were told. And so, hey, I, I went because that was the thing you needed to do. And you would go do those things. And the authority came to the priest and he became this guy who became standoffish and aloof. He was no longer the guy in the house with those eight to 12 people who was a pastor shepherding them. He was a guy who was standoffish, who was no longer ministering in depth. And so the church makes this change. But it skews the idea of spiritual authority. Because if you ask a Catholic about spiritual authority with a priest versus a, a Baptist or a Protestant person about spiritual authority with a pastor, you'll have two different views. They'll be like, that priest is reverent. You just don't approach him like that, right? And the, the guys say, well, my pastor, uh, you know, he'll shake your hand and he, he's a pretty personable guy and it's a totally different thing. Now, there's something to be said here that I don't want to lose. When we opened up in Timothy, it talked about the reverence and that idea of a pastor or overseer or a deacon and that they spiritually said need to be full of the spirit is that they need, to be, they need to be walking with the Lord. And I think we get away sometimes of thinking that um, our pastors, or Ben, or because he wears holes in his jeans. I fussed at him the other day because he had holes in his jeans. I said, that's too many holes in the jeans on Sundays. He goes, I, I'm going to start tucking my shirt in so you start wearing jeans with no holes in them or something like that. You know, And uh, we kind of have this thing we're playing back and forth. But I don't want to, you'll hear my wife correct some of the youth, when they say, hey, Ben, and I will say, or Danielle will say, it's Pastor Ben, because we want them to get to understand that there is this reverence that the guy has called and surrendered his life to serve the Lord. A deacon has said, I am going to serve God with my spouse for the rest of my life, and I'm going to hold to the integrity of the church. So I think we need to come back to a place where we understand that a deacon's role is not a role that is a status, but is a, a, a point of humility, and the pastor's is a point of humility, and, and they better be doing the right thing and teaching the right thing to their congregation because they're going to be responsible for it. And it's a, kind of a nerve-wracking thing. As a pastor, you need to be fearful about how you're bringing your people up but the role of both of those things is one that you say, gosh, that guy has agreed to be a servant the rest of his life and his wife with him. Watch this. And he's not going to do anything to tear down the walls that God has built. That he is going to give his life and she will give her life to the uplifting and will not sway from the faith even when there seems to be a wrinkle. But they will walk with integrity in that. The reason we respect the spiritual authority of those guys called to that, watch this, because that is hard to do. I'm just going to tell you right now, that's hard to do. This is what I tell every pastor now who comes to my office who surrenders to ministry and every deacon I'm going to say, here's something you're going to need to understand before you want to accept this. You are, whether you like it or not, are going to be put into a fishbowl. And everybody's going to be like this. They're going to look at your kids. They're going to look at you. And they're going to say, well, that's what he does, so it must be okay for me. And you need to understand whether you like it or not, if you're going to call, be called to this position, that you're willing to say, okay, I'm going to get in a fishbowl and I'm going to put my whole family in the fishbowl and we're going to go ahead and be okay with people looking at us. There ain't a lot of people who want to do that. But the Bible says we need to honor that for the deacon, we need to honor that for the pastor and we need to understand the authority, watch this, the authority comes from God's word. There's some 
matters that may be a pastor's opinion or a deacon's opinion, but other issues are based on God's word, come from and come with authority. For example, a church may work together to determine the kind of music they use or in a building in which they worship, but the pastor of the church can speak with the authority against sexual immorality, pride, or other sinful areas. It's going to come from the word. It's not an opinion. It comes from the word. I've ticked off families because I have spoken about some of those subjects and they didn't come back. And that, that, I, I can't let it hurt my feelings. I get hurt, you know, because I'm a human being. I hate to see people leave. But I, 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 I better not tear out a page and not preach on it because I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings because then we're going to build a church that is lukewarm. Amen? Amen. And so we've got to walk from there, and that's one of the reasons why that authority is, is so important. It's hands through personal example. Pastor's life consists of integrity, love. It allows him a level of influence and authority. Same with the deacon. This is a leadership not based on position, but based off of influence and their call to be imitators of Christ as I am of Christ from 1 Corinthians 11. 1. That's what Paul said, and that's what their calling is for. They're supposed to be imitators of Christ the best they can. Now, as a congregation, give them grace, because guess what? Those guys still sin. They're going to sin. Don't, don't hold it over their heads. And then the last thing that I want you to understand why on the spiritual authority or why we give spiritual authority to them is because the pastor is called to protect the teachings of the church. It includes guarding its doctrines and training other leaders who will support those teachings. That comes from Titus chapter 1 and verse 9 and 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Says that's what he's called to do. The scripture says if he doesn't do that, he's going to be responsible directly to God. I don't know. I know people struggle by not preaching on things because they think people are going to leave. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. So I have good friends who have left church congregations I've preached in, in and even here because I've preached on subjects that I said I, I can't sway on that. There's no biblical reason on why I cannot back that up. And so I'm just going to stay the course and be biblical about it. And if they leave, they leave. But we have to stay firm to the truth. Amen? Amen. Spiritual authority. It comes from God and that's what it goes. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and your truth. We thank you for grace and mercy. And God, I pray tonight that as we go from here, that you continue to strengthen us, continue to bless and watch over us. Thank you for a good last month. I pray that as we go into this month, that we would have a vision and grasp it and be excited about what you're going to do in the future. For we ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen.